Okay, you ready to go? Oh, for, oh, what do you say start? For two? Should so, I clap? Yeah, actually, go ahead, and then uh, I'll let Denise take it. And again, Merle, just let, thank you for letting us be here. It's a privilege, and uh, when we give you the transcripts, uh, we'll feel like we accomplished something. But right now, we'll just enjoy hearing uh, your history. Thank you. Okay. Okay, okay. take two. I am honored <laughs> for what you just said. But anyway, getting back to the start of Merle P. Christensen, this all happened in uh, uh, 1918, October of 1918, in a place called Irene, South Dakota. A little farmhouse out there just being taken care of. We had a, a small city there by the name of Irene, and it, uh, they just barely had a post office address, and that made us official. And um, But I was going to t tell you about, if, we're pretty isolated, so uh, we had for all the different farms around, anybody that had kids to go to school, that was before school buses and stuff like that available. So I think we walked. I remember telling everybody I walked five miles uphill, go to, it was actually about three quarters of a mile kind of flat. Uh, to the to the schoolhouse we had a one a one uh, room schoolhouse and uh, my dear old teacher lady Mrs. Schufelt she she taught eight grades the whole eighth, the whole thing from infancy to I guess probably some of those kids she saw throughout the entire uh, elementary school uh, school days graduated them and then. They, those that, that would go to high school didn't have far to go. We did have a high school in Irene, all right, so they'd go down there. Back in those days, they probably had a horse surge hop on bareback and go to school that way. And uh, so that's my early days. And then when I was very young, I was nine years old, my dear dad, he died. They, they had three kids at this time. They had me and my sister Lois, about three years younger, and then my my brother Warren. He was an infant. And uh, my dad has always had kind of a, a noisy heart. My mom said that she was sleeping when she could hear him go swish, swish, always, every time it would pump. But anyway, uh, something else went wrong, so they took him down to the hospital in Yankton, about 30 miles away, pretty nice hospital. And they operated on him, and he he didn't make it. He uh, today's date uh, with, the, with the technology they have, he probably would have made it, but he didn't. So then, uh, after a couple of years, times were tough. Uh, farmers were going broke, and I think they were almost bankrupt there. They had a loan on the place, and um, so I think that finally did go into bankruptcy. And uh, then my mom met a guy by the name of Jens, Jens Hansen, and he was an immigrant from from Denmark. And uh, so they uh, they got married and they were, operated the farm together. And um, they uh, he, and he just died when he was in his nineties. And my mother she died when she was her, several years later when she was in the nineties too. Am um, I losing track of something? I'm, um, but okay, that takes. But uh, I should um, ask him what they grow on the farm. Oh, what did you grow on the farm? We grew just about everything. It's called general farming: oats, corn, kale, alfalfa, stuff like that. And we did have animals. We had cattle that we milked. And we had horses we used for motive power. When I was a kid, I'd be out there, I think there's a picture of me someplace, putting the harness on a horse, throwing a collar on a big horse that was way up here, you know. And then I'd go out there and hook them up, you know. Me driving two horses, uh, and, a, and, and me sitting on a cultivator was just norm. I was raised on that sort of thing. And um, just about all the farmers were in the same situation. As before the advent, the tra tractors were available, but not not the real cute farm alls and John Deere's you see today. They, you know, so they um, 
During the fall of the year, we would go ahead and have harvest come to town. And uh, they'd uh, use a, a binder to go out and cut the grain and bind it. And uh, let it dry out there for a couple of days. And then the thrasher would come in. I had a big contraption they'd haul in with a tractor. And then uh, a bunch of the farmers, that's one thing, they all had a very kind of a cooperative spirit in those days of getting things done, big things done. And so then we go from one farm to the next to the next where the thrashing event would take place. So that means that the, that the guys, and uh, I would be on a, on a uh, pickup hay rack and we would pick up the, uh, the bundles that was all previously bundled, throw them into the rack and then drive them up to the, uh, to the feeding end of the, tra of the thrasher, throw them in there and it'd come out as grain out of one chute and straw out of another one. And terribly messy and there was always a hot time of the year. Terrible, it was a terrible environmental situation. Dust flying in all directions. They all survived. What else can I tell you about the farm? That was about, farming was kind of a grim business in those days. Yes? Oh yeah, it had to be tough back then. Um, I heard especially like World War I was tough, but I wondered, do you have any memories of any, do you, did you have any cars out there, automobiles? My dad had bought a Model T uh, for, Ford, yeah, and I had a picture of that as a four-door. I think it was a, uh, a 19, uh, what was the, the he died? I think in 27, I think he died in 29, at a 27 Ford, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was the kind that when you go to crank it, it kick, could break your arm once in a while, you know, and kick back. Wow, uh, it sounds like a pretty tough car. Um, do you remember, what do you think, remember about grade school? Um, did you like school? I don't know, I guess I did. I, it was just something I had to do. I won't say I was a terribly motivated student or anything like that. I was probably like a normal kid. And once in a while an airplane would fly over. And that would catch my attention. I would dream that someday I'd be doing that. Flying an airplane. I wanted to fly an airplane ever since I was just an infant. Well, yeah, just continue on then uh, yeah. from grade I, school then. Sure, we'll listen. Well then, well then, okay. Let's say things were tough in those days. And my mom had this new husband. And we automatically disliked each other. Uh, I was nine years old and he was a new man of the house. And so the next thing I was out, I was working at other farms around where they had needed extra farm hands, and they were glad to have me. And I would go ahead and work there, like, well, maybe for board and room, while I was finishing high school. It seems to me like, yeah, in those days, I think I finished, yeah, I did. I finished off in Vibrant High School, because most of these farmers got, where I was working were in close to Vibrant. And I, yeah, high school was more accessible. So I did that. Um, what else? Can I... Do you have any? Do you remember any friends you had back then? Say again. Any friends? Yeah, I had a lot of friends. I think you know, just, but nothing, no lasting things. You know, of course, they're all dead now too. But I mean, the, well, I'm getting pretty damn old myself. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I go back there once in a while and. Uh, my sister will get a bunch of old cohorts around. Helen Jensen, I think she was hot for me at one time, you know. And uh, my, my mom, she, she would have been happy when I joined the Navy. Instead of me marrying my wife, who I did buy, if I stayed home and married Helen Jensen. <laughs> then I could have been back there with some of my pals, you know. Probably becoming a farmer myself. Well, I wonder, uh, that South Dakota upbringing, uh, has that ever really left you? Did that no. affect your life from then on? I think I still picked up some of the values that I adhere to today, you know, and uh, for, well, going around shutting the light switches off when I want to leave one room and go to the next, and little things like that, uh, econ economic things, that traits that I picked up. We'll, we'll do lead on then to, uh, to how you ended up in the Navy because that was way before World War II, so yeah. keep going. I'll tell you what, 
I, I thought maybe that might have been one way to get me into an airplane, I suppose. But, um, but I, I did finally graduate from Bybrook High School. And uh, in, in June of that, well, when we, I signed up for the, for the Navy right away. We went up to Sioux Falls, about 40 miles away. There was a Navy recruiting office up there. And I went up there and signed up. By, and then about in October of, of uh, 37, yeah, see, I graduated from high school in 37, and in October of 37, they called me up. So I hot footed it down to, I think, Sioux City and got on a train. And uh, I was on my way to the Great Lakes Naval Training Station in Chicago. And that was the beginning of my naval career at that time. I arrived there on October the 26th, 1937, boot camp. Tell us all about that. Yeah, that's. After that, my <laughs> my name, my my world opened up vastly, and it, and it got me off that farm, the farm that I didn't was never care, had much of a uh, friendly attachment to in the first place. Well, especially if you're working for the neighbors, why not go out on your own? Sure, that's right. You yeah. betcha. Wow. Yeah. So you're out at Great Lakes Naval. I, you betcha. So this is in what, what state is that in now? That's north of Chicago. Thank you. Yeah, it's Great Great Lakes. I think it's called, you know, North Chicago is the cities, or maybe it's Waukegan, uh, where the Great Lakes uh, Train Station is still in operation today. In fact, it's expanded a lot. There's more service schools than when I was there. That took about six weeks to go through that, maybe a little bit more than that. And, uh, but first of all, uh, there would be a, a Navy chief in charge of our company. We had a company, maybe it was, 60 or maybe 80 or 90 men. And uh, he was a chief uh, chief quartermaster. He had spent most of his naval career at, at sea. And as a quartermaster, they are in charge of running the ship. There's a right arm. They have the navigational stuff. That's under their bail wick. But he turned out to be quite a man, too, quite a leader. And I remember him, Chief Hanson. I like him coat his skin and he hit name, I guess. And uh, so anyway, that was in October, then about in January, uh, time marches on, and uh, they um, sent us off to various assignments. In my case, I got into gunnery school in San Diego. So we got on the train and we went clear across country on a train. What a wonderful adventure that was. I think we went through Colorado. You can see some of the big mountains, you know, famous, famous routes. And uh, it just so happened that when we got close to uh, San Diego, we were coming down through the Los Angeles area, and they had a big time flood. And they had to, they had to reroute us to keep us out of the flood area to get us past where it was backing up, I think. That's before they had those nice big ditches, you know, drainage ditches they had running through through Los Angeles all over the place to keep flash floods. Wouldn't be nice to have a little flash flood today, huh? But but anyway, they uh, we made it down to San Diego, and I entered, um, and that's also, that's the equivalent of a, of a Great Lakes training station, but for the West Coast. I was in the Midwest, so I guess I went and so, um, but it also has this gunnery school. So I went through that gunnery school, and the gunnery school is mostly learning about the guns, about the big naval guns, from small guns, how to take a machine gun apart, up to the big, humongous, big battleship, 16-inch guns, and how, just learning stuff about it, you know, go, going to school, bag, powder bags, put the, put the shell in, ram it, put in several powder bags full of smokeless powder and silk powder bags in the back and ram it, close that breech, and then there'd be the igniter and 